Hello and welcome to this video on assessment of a country as a market. So in this video we're going to look at the range of factors a company may consider when evaluating whether to enter a country as a potential market to sell their products in. So if we're a business located in a particular country and we're thinking about which markets we might expand into, we need to think on what basis we might make that decision. What sort of factors would we consider about whether this is going to be a good market in which to sell our products? And in this video, we're going to look at five um, factors that a business might consider. The first one is the disposable income in the country that we're considering entering. And disposable income is income that consumers have left to spend after they've paid um, taxes. So this is important as this is really the money they can use to spend on uh, goods and services. Businesses looking to expand internationally may identify countries with fast growing income per capita as a key factor in the decision as to whether this is a, an attractive market. In particular, rising disposable incomes are often associated with the growth of uh, a middle class within a country and the middle class typically have money to spend on products and services and if we're thinking about a company that's uh, a western uh, developed economy then often they make products and services targeted at this middle class market this map here shows us income per capita for different countries around the world so a very dark blue uh, color indicates a high income per capita and the lighter we get towards a lighter blue means a low income per capita. So we can see straight away that most of Western Europe, North America, these countries have quite high incomes. What we'd be interested as a business perhaps is not really targeting the very light blue colored countries. So, you know, Central and, and Southeastern Africa, because maybe the income levels aren't really sufficient in these regions to warrant uh, mass consumption of goods and services but we'd be interested in the kind of lighter blue colors so perhaps we'd be thinking about china and southeast asia perhaps we'd be thinking about um, south america perhaps we'd be thinking about southeastern europe as potentially south, uh, um, areas that we'd be interested perhaps in as markets of particular interest is this idea of the growing middle class in different areas. Now, let's pick out some key figures here. What we can see in 2015 is that we have a majority of middle class people are from the Asia Pacific region, region so 46%. We can see that a significant proportion of middle classes are in Europe, but when we look at 2030 instead, when we start to look at the growth of the middle class, we see quite a significant and important trend. We can see that the growth in the middle class in Asia Pacific goes from 1.3 billion people to an estimated three and a half billion people. So it's gone from 46% of the middle class being in this region to 65%. So around the world, significant growth in middle class in Asia uh, and Pacific countries is forecast. When you look at Europe, much more declining influence here. So this is going to obviously pay, uh, play an important part in future businesses' decisions about which markets to target. Our second category is the ease of doing business. So how accessible are markets for a business? For example, is there lots of bureaucracy and form fillings, rules and regulations that increase the time taken to do business, for example, paperwork that needs to be filled in describing exported products. Often this is to do with the effectiveness of government and the regulatory framework that that government has in a country. For example, Singapore is one of the easiest countries in the world to do business and as a result is seen as an attractive market as costs will be reduced. In contrast, somewhere like China, although very attractive in terms of the size of the population, the growth of the middle classes is a more difficult place to do business. There are lots of uh, bureaucracy and form filling, which makes it uh, more costly to do business there. An organization called the World Bank 
um, published data on uh, the ease of doing business around the world and rank countries. Here's an example of the top 10 countries. So they rank them over issues such as starting a business, how easy is it to start a business, what forms needed to fill in, um, construction, how easy is it to build something, how easy is it to get an electricity connection, how is it, easy is it to register property with the, the, the government, how easy is it to get credit, and how well are investors protected in their investments. And we can see countries like New Zealand, Singapore, Denmark, Hong Kong, South Korea, Georgia, Norway, United States, and just the UK at the bottom, are considered some of the easiest countries in which to enter the market and set up a business. At the other end of the scale, some of the worst performing countries are countries like Somalia, Eritrea, Venezuela, Yemen, Libya, South Sudan. In these countries, it's much more difficult to set up a business or it's much more risky to do so. Our third category was infrastructure. And so this is the physical systems that a country or a business requires to operate effectively. So things like roads, railways, airports, phone and internet networks, and utilities such as electricity, gas, and water. Developed countries such as the EU and the USA tend to have better quality infrastructure, making it easier to do business. For example, getting a flight to the UK. However, many developing countries are investing heavily in their infrastructure. For example, a lot of developing countries now have high speed internet, and this makes them increasingly attractive destinations as markets. Here are a couple of figures to look at. This one here on the right hand side, this figure ranks the overall quality of infrastructure in major economies. We can see that Germany is a high performing country, consistently getting a high score for its quality of uh, infrastructure, contrasted perhaps with Italy, which gets a lower score. So on this basis, we might assume that Germany is a slightly more competitive market, a slightly more desirable market to be operating in than Italy. It's going to be easier to transport our products, easier to communicate with customers and so on. This infographic on the right hand side illustrates some of the issues with um, African infrastructure. So African cities tend to be quite isolated. They're not particularly connected with each other. Often these cities are quite uh, crowded and often these cities are quite expensive to operate in compared to other countries in the world. However, the bottom half of this infographic shows us particularly that significant investments in infrastructure could uh, make these uh, African cities become much more attractive markets in which to sell products. Political stability is our next category. So political stability has increased in some areas of the world whilst declining in others. Poor governance by the government, particularly in some less developed countries, has made it difficult to trade successfully. In some countries, corruption is rife. So people don't necessarily follow the rules or accept bribes or expect bribes in order to be able to do business. A more extreme case is civil wars continue to impact on the ability to use a country as a market. Here are some rankings on political instability. On the left hand side, we can see the most vulnerable, the most politically unstable, although this was back in uh, 2010. We can see countries like Zimbabwe, Chad, Congo, Cambodia, Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, unsurprisingly, these, these are particularly unstable countries politically and so difficult to consider as, um, uh, as a market. On the right hand side, we see some of the least vulnerable countries to political instability. So the most stable politically. So think countries like Norway, Denmark, Canada, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, Costa Rica and Mauritius, these countries um, see less political upheaval, less political change, and therefore uh, less corruption, better governed countries. Geographic proximity of the market to uh, the business's home country is also an important consideration. Being close in terms of geography has a number of potential advantages lower transportation costs, it's easier to manage the expansion, i.e., we can go and visit the country. Um, we can uh, communicate with the people in the country more easily 
and often close by countries are likely to be similar in terms of culture and therefore they likely have some of the same tastes and preferences as our consumers. So as a result we often get the emergence of trade blocks, geographical trade blocks that allow countries to or businesses to trade more easily. For example the European Union, uh, we have in Southeast Asia ASEAN, um, we have in South America Mercosur, we've looked at these previously but these trade blocks enable uh, businesses to trade with nearby countries more effectively. So we might prioritize those markets that are near us geographically. Finally, exchange rates. Exchange rates have a significant impact on the profits of a business operating in foreign markets. For example, if the exchange rate of a currency appreciates, it's going to be more expensive to export to foreign countries. Conversely, when we bring money back from that foreign country, it's going to be more expensive i.e. the foreign currency when we convert it back into our currency is going to be of less value. So this will impact negatively on profits of the business. So we might turn down a country where their currency value is particularly weak. It's going to be hard to sell to them and when we do sell to them and bring money back then we're not going to get much of a return. So for example we might decide that actually countries down here that with particularly weak undervalued currencies might not be that attractive. Any money that we earn in lira or any money that we earn in rubles when we bring that money back to our country if we're in euros or pounds or dollars we're going to get less back in terms of profit. Likewise countries that have a, have a stronger exchange rate might be more desirable markets if we sell there successfully the value of what we receive is likely to be quite high when we bring it back to our market. There may also be other factors so for example things like cultural co compatibility are our products our services going to sell well in another country are McDonald's going to be able to sell beef burgers in uh, the Hindu country India. What about the level of domestic competition that might be another factor and there might also be strategic reasons, reasons for diversification of risk perhaps, uh, looking at the economic cycle, there might be um, other reasons to consider entering a market. So in this video we've looked at the range of factors a company may consider when evaluating whether a country is a good potential market. That's it, thanks very much for listening.